Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a weekly show featuring interviews with fantastic authors sharing their personal stories on how and why they write. There's hints and tips for aspiring writers and great book reviews from top bloggers. Follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink, cause it's joined up writing. The epilogue. Christmas special! <laughs> Yes, welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. As you know, the epilogue shows are usually quick listen shows featuring a bonus question from the previous week's guest, but today is a bumper Christmas bonus show where we've got not one, but two guests for your listening pleasure. First up will be last week's guest, literary author Claire Fuller, talking about writing short stories, followed by a longer chat with indie sci-fi mystery and crime writer Steve Turnbull. Before we dive in, I just wanted to wish you all a happy Christmas and I hope you're all getting some time to relax, read and write over the festive break. Also wanted to thank you for the amazing support and feedback you've given me since I relaunched the show back in September. The new format seems to be working out really well, but please do get in touch and let me know if there's any other content, different guests or... Well, anything else you'd like to hear as the show moves into 2018 and beyond. I also want to thank all of the guests that have dropped by. I've loved chatting to some fascinating people and I've got some more crackers lined up for next year too. I also want to shout out to my writing buddy and co-conspirator Maria Smith. Maria is a tireless cheerleader of the show and she's also collaborating with me on a non-fiction project that I'll be telling you more about next year. She's always there giving me a friendly kick in the pants to tell me to write or just check in with my progress and I really appreciate that. And finally, a special mention goes to Victoria Goldman and Catherine Sunderland, who are now my regular contributors to Book Bloggers Corner. Aside from being very lovely people, their passion for spreading the word about new books and helping new writers is an inspiration, and I feel privileged to have their input and support with the show. Okay, that's enough festive love. Let's get to the first of today's interviews, a chat with Claire Fuller. If you haven't had a chance yet, you should check out Claire's full interview from last week, But for the epilogue, I talked to Claire about her love of writing short stories. Okay, Claire, thanks for hanging around for the epilogue for our little bonus question. Um, And yeah, we touched on it briefly in your main interview, but you mentioned a couple of times short stories and the fact that you you started off writing short stories, um, but you've also had success with Radio 4 opening lines, competition, etc. So tell us a little bit about why you like to write them and if you find it helpful with your other writing as well, what tips have you got to, to share as regards writing a good short story? Mm. Um, I, yeah, I really love writing them, although I find them difficult. Um, they are hard things to get a whole, a whole story in a short, condensed form, you know, the beginning, middle and end. Lots. I have judged quite a few short story competitions and, Part of the issue is, I think, for the ones that don't win, often for me, is that they don't—they aren't contained within that limited length, whatever mm-hmm. that limit is. Mm-hmm. If it feels often like they need another two thousand words, or, or sometimes to be made shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like that restriction, though. I like having a limited amount of words to work with I think I wonder if it comes from the MA the creative and critical writing MA that it was on where I would be set deadlines and Mm -hmm. word counts and the word counts I I liked working within that restricted Mm. yeah well presumably I mean one of the one of the things I agree I mean one of the things I like about short fiction and especially if you have to work to uh, you know a set a set word count is that it does make your writing tighter one of the mm-hmm. things especially yeah. if you if you write a story i mean you pro- i don't know whether you work the same but often when i've written 
short stories. I'll often write a short story and it might be like two and a half thousand words or something. And the word limit is 1700 words. Mm-hmm. And for a start, you think, I, I can't, I just can't tell that story in 1700 words. I just can't do it. And then as you start to chip away, you think, actually, I can. Yeah. And it's better. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's just better. It's tighter. And every word earns its place and, and every sentence and, and every paragraph. I, I like that. That's. I often also write flash fiction, which you have to sell a, tell a story in a hundred words, mm-hmm. um, and that really does make you hone your writing. And, and I like the challenge. Yeah. It's, it often takes quite a, a longer time, doesn't it, to write something short, so short, to get it down to such a short yes, word length. Yes, it does. It does. But but. The satisfaction compared to novel writing, which is, you know, two, three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's ov- obviously, you can write a hundred word flash fiction in a day or a lot less. And so that, that satisfaction of having created a complete thing is, is, is better. You know, you get more mm-hmm. often. <laughs> and do, do, you appro- um, do you approach writing short stories in the same way that you approach novel writing? You've got the no, same kind not- of process? No, I think I do think about them a lot more in advance, just in my head, without writing any notes, but I can kind of imagine a bit more of what happens in the whole story than I do with the novel, with, where, where I'm discovering things as I'm writing. Um, so often I'll have the first line in my head and who the character is and what they're going to do. So I do start with a bit more of a plan, even though I haven't written it down. But I do also use short stories when I'm writing a novel, because I don't plan, sometimes I do get stuck. It's not quite like writer's block, but I'm just not quite sure what the characters are going to do next. Mm-hmm. So I'll sometimes lift them out of the novel, plonk them in a completely different place and write a short story around them. Because I know these people so well that it's quite interesting to see what they'll discu- what, what I'll discover when they are in a different location or a different time or with different characters. Um, that, and then that sometimes feeds back into the novel and it helps me progress. Well, that's really interesting because one of the things that's come up on the show before is not so much writing a short story, but taking a character and writing a monologue, say, from first-person perspective in that character to kind of work mm-hmm. out what's going on in the head. But that's kind of taken it another step further. It's taking a character and putting them in a different situation. That's really interesting. So have you had sort of... Having done that, have you had short stories that you've then been able to use somewhere else, you know, using character? Maybe you've tweaked it and used it for a competition or anything else? Um, yes, I'm not sure they've won any. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I have submitted them, yes, um, because then the story begins to take on a life of its own and and I don't, I end up editing it for the story's sake, not not for the novel that it came from. So, yeah, I have worked quite a few like that and definitely lots of flash fiction um, because obviously when, if that gets put into the novel as a scene, it gets expanded hugely, but the, sh- the flash fiction can remain very tight as it is and I've submitted those for competitions or journals and I've had some of those published. Well, that's really interesting, a really interesting way of looking at it, using it as a tool for your longer writing as well. I can mm. understand it from the point of view of... Uh, as you say, learning your craft and making your writing tighter, more concise. But I haven't heard it used like that. That's a really good idea, Trans- transplanting your um, characters into a different situation and sort of yeah. seeing how they behave. You know, it really kind of helps, really helps me when, I, when I'm when i a bit stuck. As long as the, the place you put them isn't too re- removed from the novel, you know, you don't Mars. put them on another planet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. You might learn some things about them. It depends how extreme it is. <laughs> well, that's really good. Well, that's really good advice. So, and and are there specific places for people that are again just starting out and maybe thinking about getting into story writing? Because again, I've spoken to lots of kind of people that you know treat writing as a hobby or whatever, and they they do scribble away and they do write some short stories, but they don't do anything with them. They just shut them in a drawer. What what would be your advice to people that do that? I I always like to have a couple of short stories out on submission either to journals or to competitions because the the process of writing a novel as i said is 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 long and you two or three years you don't really get any feedback 
but you send out some novels, uh, sort of send out some short stories, it always feels like there's a tiny little bit of hope. And if you have a few, then every time you get a rejection or you haven't won the competition, you've got another one out there anyway. So it kind of keeps keeps that momentum going. Yeah, and keeps your right, keeps your hand in, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Why you, why you have yeah. to uh, all the, especially with as you say with traditional publishing and the kind of timescales that you've uh, that you've got going. Have you have you ever been tempted to write? I know you you know you kind of you just written your third book, but have you ever been tempted to write a series or? take some characters out of one of your other novels and develop that for something else um not always... really no it's not no because i think the ideas for the novels i don't have any problems with ideas they're almost too many and not enough time mm-hmm. so um i've never taken them out in that way you just no. like the idea that it's just a self-contained piece a story yeah 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 think who knows well yeah <laughs> never say never who knows yeah, yeah. <laughs> who knows yeah you might you might get bothered by another character and your subconscious comes back and from they, one of your early novels and you have yeah. to write about them again you never know yeah oh that's great okay. well well thanks really appreciate that it's really uh some really good tips there and um we again something we've talked about before but short fiction i think is a really good tool for helping you improve your writing and um there's some really good tips there so appreciate appreciate that and um Good luck with book three when it comes out. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time, Claire. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. There you go. And thanks again to Claire Fuller. And if you do want to check out Claire's work, go to clairefuller.co.uk. Right, let's not hang about and move straight on to this week's second guest, Steve Turnbull. Steve began his career as a trained computer programmer before moving into magazine publishing, dabbling in screenwriting and eventually fiction, writing across multiple genres including sci-fi, mystery and crime. He's independently published a number of successful series including his recent Malia Anderson Mysteries. Yeah, hi Steve. Thanks for joining us on Joined Up Writing Podcast. Um, yeah, brilliant. So one of the things that struck me when I was doing a little bit of research and looking into your books and a little bit about you is you're very, very prolific and you describe yourself as writing mystery, thriller and crime, but across kind of alternate worlds. So why don't you start us off just telling us a little bit about the kind of thing that you write and a little bit about your Void Ships universe. Okay. Um, well, it actually goes back... I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years, I was um, doing screenwriting. I'd written this, I was working with a director and he said, and I, we, we were trying to look at something, something really short that we could film, but we wanted to make it a thriller of some sort. Mm-hmm. So I wrote this thing and he said, yeah, yeah it's great, um, but could you make it steampunk? Yeah. And I thought, and so I said, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he told me, and I went, "Oh, that sounds fantastic. That's definitely me." And when he, when you said, "What is that?" Uh, what did he actually say? You know, what did he say? How did he explain it to you for people? Because there'll be people listening to this podcast that'll be like, "Steam what?" Well, I can't remember what he said at the time. <laughs> uh, he probably he probably went into something sort of vaguely about Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and technology. Um, but the, 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 the classy way of describing it is um, uh, retro Victorian science fiction, um, which essentially is you're writing science fiction, but as it would have been written back then. In the steam age, yeah. Yeah. So I was doing that. So we, I, I'd written a, written a thing. Um, but for various reasons, we, we stopped working together. We're still big friends, but we couldn't work together anymore. Um, and um, I thought, well, okay, I'd really like to, you know, the, the ideas that I've written, I'd really like to get them made. Um, but, you know, we need backing and we need, a, we need an audience. So I thought, I know, I'll write a book. Mm-hmm. You know, as you do. As you do, yeah. So I noticed that, like, kind of uh, one of your main series of books revolves around your main character, uh, Malay, uh, well, pr- excuse my pronunciation, but Malaha. Anderson. Anderson. I pronounce it Malia. Malia. Okay. Yeah. Malia Anderson. I don't know whether that's right. <laughs> but that's how you say it. That's how you That's how it. I say it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that main character and a little bit more about this Void Ships universe that I mentioned earlier on. Um, world building is something that I really enjoy doing. So what I did was I went back and went, okay, there is one single change. And that is that in 1847, Sir Michael Faraday, not Tesla note, mm-hmm. not Tesla, but Faraday, because he's British. <laughs> um, so Faraday in 1847 discovers partial anti-gravity. He figures out a way that you can remove the weight of things a little bit, not 100%, but just a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I basically built a world where, where as time went on, this this technology has more and more of an effect on society. But essentially, the entirety of the Victorian period and into the Edwardian period are on the surface, it's just the same, but mm-hmm. they have flying machines and they can go into space. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, but you still have the empires. You have the British Empire, the the uh, German latecomers trying to build their empire. I even have the scramble for Africa, and all the historical details are in there somewhere. As I like to say, my books are historically accurate, except where they're not. <laughs> so into this, I put. Malia Anderson, um, an Anglo-Indian who is traveling back for the first story, is traveling back to India from having been at boarding school in England and having generally a nightmarish time of it because, of course, she's not white. Mm-hmm. Um, and somebody gets murdered on board the vessel. So you've got your classic sort of... Um, Locked room kind of... <laughs> you have murder on the Orient yeah. Express, number of uh, suspects, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and that's her first case. Actually, it's not her first case because, as is mentioned in the books, it's actually her second. Um, but I didn't write the first one. <laughs> it's the first one you got around to writing. <laughs> yeah, I haven't written that one yet. Although I do have a large number of fans who are waiting, mostly patiently. <laughs> For you to get round to it. Yeah, that must be good fun to write. So just tell us a little bit about, in general, just taking a step back then, tell us a little bit about how you came to write fiction in the first place. Was it something that you always wanted to do? And why in particular this type of genre? I know you mentioned this, this steampunk kind of the story about how you got specifically into that, but you must have been sort of attracted to maybe the sci-fi type of things or historical fiction. Why, why did you get into writing fiction in the first place? That's yeah. That's that's actually quite. I, I've, that I do find interesting is because I was a. I used my my father had was a huge science fiction fan, um, and he bought all these books. He had astounding science fiction magazines from the fifties, mm-hmm. which I ate my way through. Um, I ate, ate my way then ate my way through every science fiction book in the local library. So I would read science fiction and fantasy, and I didn't read anything else. Seriously, absolutely nothing else. That was my entire diet of reading. Mm -hmm. When I was 15, I wrote my first novel. Mm -hmm. I I still have a copy of it. It's appalling. (laughs) Um, So every now and again, I'll yank it out and have a look and say, yes, yes, I really have improved. Um, And then I wrote another one uh, almost immediately. Uh, I mean, these are novels. They were were over 50,000 words. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was pounding them out on a manual typewriter in the evenings, two copies using carbon copy paper, (laughs) um, because I knew I needed to have one copy because I could send the other one off. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped. I started writing poetry. I had a band. Um, I wrote music. I I did music as well um, and sculpting and painting. (laughs) But those dropped by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got employed on a magazine. Now, it was a computer magazine, um, but it involved writing. So yeah. for the next 20-odd 20, 20 years, I was r- working on magazines. I went from being an editorial assistant through to editor, through to running my own publishing company, producing magazines. You remember Robot Wars, the original Robot Wars? I do, yeah. They had, they had a subscription magazine, uh, which we produced. Um, and uh, I did lots of other stuff in production then I worked in a, then I ran co-ran a design company uh, and then I jacked it all in and went back to being a programmer 
because yeah. it's very stressful running a business and I wasn't enjoying it, so I stopped. But it was in the 90s that I wrote another fantasy book, which is actually published. Um, but again, I did that, touted it around a bit because this was before self-publishing. Mm -hmm. um, I got a couple of little nibbles. People sort of thought it was quite interesting, but obviously it wasn't good enough, which is fair enough. Yeah. So you mentioned there you, you had a, a, a little foray into traditional publishing. Um, you know, when you, early part of your career when you were just getting started out. Obviously, yeah. eventually, when self-publishing came along, it sounds like, well, and it looks like, you know, looking at your body of work, that you kind of really embraced it. Tell us a little bit about your self-publishing experience, or, or indie publishing, if you want to call it that. I don't know which you prefer. It depends who you speak to. Um, and, uh, yeah, what, what, you know, what made you kind of want to go down that route? Right, well... My experience isn't typical, although I know everybody's is different, but because I, I was in, although I wasn't publishing books, I was publishing magazines. Um, and I was a journalist, so writing stuff fast and getting it out and seeing it published is something that I'm very, was very used to. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I could do it myself wasn't a particularly radical one because i already had the ability to, to, to jump just straight to well that's fine i'll just do that then you just went cracked on with it so and and how did you tell us a little bit about your kind of process from start to finish because obviously people if they're not familiar with self-publishing or or you know professional writing however you want to put it some people probably just think you know you write your manuscript you might edit it and then you send it out or whatever uh, and it just gets published but obviously with self-publishing or independent publishing there's quite a lot of steps that you kind of have to do or you kind of have to embrace obviously there's the editing which you may or may not do in-house i don't do you do you keep work with an external editor or do you have other people looking at cover art tell us a little bit about the process from start to finish I, I'm not one of these people who goes back and rewrites and rewrites and rewrites. And rewrites. I, I, I can't be doing with that. Um, I write it first, right first time. I don't, I am a discovery writer, uh -huh. which is the posh way of saying a, a pantser. Pantser, yeah. There is always a risk when you are, when you start rewriting that you take away the life. You, you can take the life out of your story. Now, the Malia Anderson books are written from scratch in one go. I usually, I know the beginning, I know the end, everything else is up for grabs. Uh -huh. um, I've just finished an epic science fiction story, uh, which is 200K, over, over 200K, um, which is written like a TV series. It's, it's like a mini series in a book. Uh -huh. um, that's multiple protagonist, multiple bad guy, multiple through line, and has to be had to be planned to the inch to make it work. And what about in relation to things like cover art and sort of promotion? Yeah. How do you go about that? Well, um, I certainly don't have any talent whatsoever in that field, and I I hate anybody who can do who can write <laughs> and produce covers. Okay. I mean, that's just I just. That's, just just horrible it's just it's not fair um so no i use i've used lots of different cover artists uh, i'm just about to commission a new cover artist um for a fantasy series that i'm starting by the way warning to anybody out there don't have too many series running simultaneously <laughs> and why it's is a that it's a nightmare because everybody who you know, I've got, I have got um, the Malia Anderson series, the Frozen Beauty series, the uh, Iron Pegasus series. I've just started the uh, Dragons of Estenus series. Chimera, which will be a series, um, that's five. Oh, and I have a pen name who writes Erotica, and she's just written the first book in a series. Um, so that's another one. And... What we've got here is a situation where I have six series and I have fans of the individual series and they all want the next book, please, as soon as possible. <laughs> it's a nice position to be in, though. 
It would be if I could afford to be. I, mean, I can't yet afford to give up the day job. <laughs> yeah, so you've got to find the time. Well, on that subject, how do you find the time? What what um, you know what does I know especially if you've got a day job working around a day job. I know from personal experience is always tricky anyway. But what does kind of a normal writing day or writing session look like for you? Well, I'm I'm not writing as much as I uh, as I usually do at the moment. Um, Normally, when I'm at going at full speed, um, I should explain that although I do have a day job as a web contractor, I in this my, my current contract, I'm allowed to work at home, mm -hmm. which, which is convenient. Um, so basically, I don't do anything during the day um, in terms of writing, um, except maybe answer a few emails and mm -hmm. start a few things going. Um, and I am quite active on both Facebook writing groups and Google Plus writing groups. Yeah. So that goes up till about four o'clock. Then I'll do sort of maybe marketing stuff for an hour or so. Um, then there's the evening, which the early evening, which is just family time. If, if, if it's a good day, I'll be sitting down at eight o'clock and writing for two to two and a half hours. I... I use a an internet blocking software, yeah, so that I can't go on to Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or <laughs> anything. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I need it. Um, I am quite disciplined, and I do love deadlines. The trouble with self publishing is that they're self imposed deadlines, uh -huh. and of course, those are the easiest ones to break. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, just before we wrap up, if you had kind of one piece of advice for aspiring writers out there, people that may be just beginning their journey, what would it be? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me this question. I'm <laughs> sure I had. I'm, I'm sure I had an answer. Um, I wonder what it was. Yeah, um, you're either writing or you're not. <laughs> so, like Yoda says, no try, only do. Exactly. I mean, I I, I hate that word. I really hate, hate it. <laughs> But yeah, you just have to do it. Yeah, you know what? It's going to be, it's going to be crap, probably. You know, the first stuff you write, almost certainly. Um, but that's okay, because you know, it's not it's this. It's not original for me to say this, but you know, you're not expected if you if you were learning to cook and you didn't know anything about cooking, you wouldn't be expected to turn out a gourmet dish the first time, would you? Exactly. So you're not going to turn out the best book in the world i know i didn't <laughs> so i still have a copy of it <laughs> <laughs> to prove it yeah and that's that's a great way of looking at it well that's a good place to, to kind of wind things up i think so just for people that are listening now just tell them where they can find you, a bit about you online and where whereabouts you live you've kind of mentioned your social media things as well so tell us about that okay right i think probably the best the easiest thing to do is say that you can find me at steve turnbull dot mm -hmm. me on the intertubes um, and that's got links to everywhere else. I mean, I am on Twitter and I am on Facebook. Well, I'll make sure that I put those links in the show notes anyway, Steve, so people okay. can find you and uh, good luck with juggling all those series. Oh, thank you. And thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you for having me. There you go. Thanks again to Steve, and you should check out his work on Amazon and over at his website, steveturnbull.me. That wraps it up for this year, but there's a great interview to look forward to on January the 2nd when my chat with Bonnie McBird will go live. American author Bonnie writes new Sherlock Holmes adventures, and we had a ball talking all things Sherlock, as well as her early screenwriting career, writing the story for the original Tron film. So definitely tune in to that next week. In the meantime, please feel free to remind your friends and family about the show, and leave an iTunes review, that would be fantastic, especially from our international listeners, that would be much appreciated. You can get in touch on Twitter at JU Podcast, you can follow us on Facebook, or you can drop me a line on Twitter as well at Mr. Kelly to you. So that's it for this year. Thanks for listening to the Joined Up Writing Podcast. Happy New Year, and I look forward to seeing you all in 2018. I'm Wayne Kelly, happy reading and writing, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.